Welcome to Business Unmuted, our regular business podcast looking at business issues brought to you on different platforms including LinkedIn, YouTube, Spotify and Apple Podcast and brought to you in conjunction with Virtue BMW, part of Gateshead-based Virtue Motors PLC. This edition is a special edition. It was recorded just as the Climate Change COP26 summit was coming to a conclusion and included two people who'd been to the summit. And the reason we recorded it then was that the panel was going to discuss the issue of climate change. And we recorded it live at the Entrepreneurs Forum's annual conference, Together We Can Take On The World. Today's discussion is in audio only, so you can listen to it on your car radio or maybe as you're working on your laptop or desktop computer. Now the discussion is with four principal guests who are in different areas of polluting industries, but they aren't the polluters, they're bringing solutions to the issues. The industries are power generation, uh, transportation, also uh, household pollution, which uh, one of our guests is trying to tackle by looking at boilers and the latest uh, in heat, uh, air source heat pumps, and also in the issue of waste management and construction. All of these industries pollute and create greenhouse gases and we need to tackle them to tackle climate change. So listen in as we have our live conversation and our guests are Matt Boyle from Turntide Transport, uh, Tristan Zipfel from EDF Renewables, Kevin Brown from Pacifica Group, and Natasha Balding from Sphere. Well, welcome. Welcome to Business Unmuted, live from the Entrepreneurs Forum. We've got our guests here. Matt Boyle, first up, from Turntide Transport. Matt, you have just been, as has Natasha, to the COP26 conference. First of all, tell us what you were doing yesterday. It was Transport Day, wasn't Trans it? Transport Day, yeah. So, um, amongst other things, I, I, I met and uh, discussed with people like Hitachi Rail the, um, the challenge of electrifying uh, trains which can't be powered from overhead lines. 52% uh, of our, like 58% now, of our track is actually not electrified. So how do you, how do you run trains which are powered by electricity across un unelectrified lines? And that, the easiest way of doing that is to put batteries in them. There are other solutions, but batteries is probably the most sensible way of doing it. So that was one of the things I was talking about yesterday. Um, and and as, as most people probably know, I mean, around, around COP26, there are a number of action hubs and, and business forums that people will have to get involved in. Um, and I was, I was doing a bit of that as well. I didn't get back last night um, or this morning until about one o'clock, Graham. So this, is, well, this was, this was a, an unwelcome shout, I have to say. Well, we're very grateful you did come because uh, <laughs> you've been part of the solution, not the problem, this year. Uh, Turntide is a big American company. Tell us a bit about that and why they invested a hundred million pounds in the Northeast in the summer of this year. So Turntide is, is actually a private business still. It has um, investors which include uh, Bill Gates, um, Jeff Bezos, uh, Robert Downey Jr. So Iron Man's in there, um, and and they they. Um, the chairman, the executive chairman and I go back quite a ways, but they are focused entirely on improving the efficiency of things like buildings, but also in the last year they've turned their focus to transport. And the, the chart you showed earlier on is the reason why. So in the region, um, most people who are in this room and know me, uh, in this region there have been three or four businesses which have been focused solely on transport. Um, Hyperdrive makes batteries for electric vehicles and the Hitachi Rail, uh, Hitachi train will use those batteries. Um, the Gateshead uh, business that I used to run um, is focused in a, in a number of sectors, but automotive is its primary focus at the moment. Uh, and Avid um, in Cramlington is focused on um, commercial vehicles and large commercial vehicles. And I put together a plan to, to bring all three businesses together, and it was funded by Turntide. And we invested 100 million pounds, uh, 110 million pounds actually, into the Northeast um, to acquire those businesses and set them up for the future. 
That's fantastic. And that is a fantastic investment, ladies and gentlemen, right in the middle of this economic problems. We've had 100 million, thanks to Matt, bringing in Turntide. Now, that means we've got a cluster of companies that develops batteries, inverters, and motors, but you weren't taking it to the traditional automotive sector, were you? You were looking Lord, outside no. of that. Lord, no. No, um, you don't make money, <laughs> well, I have to be careful what I say. You, you do make money um, supplying automotive, but not a lot of money. Mm. Um, but there are, there are other sectors which, have, um, which are actually require more focus. Um, f 12 years ago, I was working with uh, the automotive businesses, the automotive sector in electrifying. And they've done a very good job of accelerating electrification. In fact, I drive an electric car. Um, but there are a number of other sectors, aerospace, marine, rail, uh, you know, industrial processes, uh, the, the larger commercial vehicles, which haven't had electrification up until now. And that's where we're focused. I was listening to the transport secretary the other day on radio. He was being challenged about uh, air flights and how polluting they were, and he answered that, the technology will provide less polluting aeroplanes, but then you look at the system, for instance, baggage handling, the, the actual uh, vehicles that take your baggage from the, return, uh, the terminal to the aeroplane, those are the kind of vehicles that could use your technology and electrify. Well, I should have gotten to Grant Shapps before that interview because 20 years ago, I was electrifying the Charlotte tow tractors and the Lindy tow tractors that run around Heathrow Airport. Um, those those um, applications are actually already electrified. Mm. The, the, the biggest challenge for us is actually the electrification of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. and, and that will start by people, by us taking, taking loads off the, off the big turbines and, and making the hotel loads, the things like a, the, the AC in the aircraft, the entertainment system that always plays bad movies, um, and turning those uh, into things powered by by batteries or, or um, off hydrogen. So that's the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is getting commercial aircraft um, to, to be eco-friendly. And I know a number of businesses, I, I deal with a lot of them, who are at the forefront in this country of all of these technologies. Uh, and unfortunately, we do not, have not, um, but we will start telling people about it. Okay, let's move on if you don't mind, Matt, because no. there's other, other sectors that the North East is certainly leading on. Tristan Zipfel is a National Director for EDF Renewables. Tristan, I know you love the North East, you live in the North East, and your national firm is making a big contribution. We saw that 21% of the greenhouse gases were through energy production, but your business is about alternative energy production. What specific areas, what specific platforms are you using? That's a great question, and I think... Um, We'll need a lot of different technologies. And I, I think um, it's easy to jump to conclusions to, for instance, or oh, the solution is solar or the solution is wind. In reality, we'll need all of it because the scale of the challenge is so wide um, and so deep that um, we'll need uh, to leverage all these technologies. It's, in fact, it's great news that we have um, these technologies that are already delivering um, and that have proved their um, uh, ability to decarbonize electricity production very economically. Um, so we, we have the, the technologies, and I think we'll need all of them, and they, they provide different things. Um, so we, we, we at EDF very much believe in a balanced um, electricity mix um, leveraging on nuclear, leveraging on solar, leveraging on wind, and by combining the strength of these different technologies, you actually create an energy mix that is both um, competitive, decarbonized, um, and also ensure security of supply. Now, I know uh, off our east coast, there's a practical example of what you're Absolutely. doing. The red car wind turbine farm, mm -hmm. just a few miles out to sea, that is your yes. uh, wind turbine Life. farm. Give us, give us an idea of the scale of that. How much electricity can be produced from those right. turbines? Well, um, if, if, to give an, an, an impression of the scale, it's not enough to look at what's happening today because uh, you need to look at what is needed to achieve net zero. Um, and to achieve net zero, we need, um, obviously, to decarbonize our electricity production. And the government is aiming to do that in the mid-2030s. But electricity is only the first step in that journey. And in fact, to deliver net zero, you need to also decarbonize 
transport, you need to decarbonize heat, you need to decarbonize all these sectors uh, that are uh, at times really difficult to decarbonize. And the, the way to do that to a large extent would be through electrification. So not only will we need to decarbonize the way we produce electricity today, but we will need to do a lot more a lot more electricity. If you look at the government targets, um, uh, they're not coming from me, they're coming from the, the Climate Change Committee. Uh, by 2050, we'll have to multiply by seven how much renewable electricity is produced in this country. So it's, it's, it so gives you an idea of the scale. Seven times more renewable. Now, the, the thing is that if you get seven times more renewable, and you're, you're certainly leading the way because you've got the solar farms, you've got, the, uh, yeah. you've got the, uh, the, the wind farms, and there are more wind farms to come. For every gigawatt you produce of clean electricity, everyone here will have their own carbon footprint reduced because the electricity they consume will mean their business has a, a smaller carbon footprint, won't it? Absolutely. And this is uh, what we see at the moment. We see uh, that uh, the demand from businesses um, to engage in that journey to net zero um, is uh, rising at staggering speed. Um, and we work with a lot of businesses across the country, um, some of them very advanced in their journey to net zero, some of them just embarking into that journey, and we are um, there to help them, um, provide them with the products, uh, some of them fairly simple, some of them more sophisticated, depending on where they are in that journey, to achieve their goals. Now, obviously, we're in business here, not just, we're not just here for goodwill, and it is goodwill that we want to get to net zero for, but there are some business benefits, crunchy ones, in the supply chain. Yes. Here in the Northeast, we're in a u unique position to take advantage of the supply chain. Can you explain the kind of things that uh, EDF and its other peers in the energy supply sector will help deliver for Northeast businesses? Yes, there's two things I, I, I can mention there. First, actually, renewable energy generation, it's local, as you say, it's local, it's local jobs. Um, and just look at the, I mean, you've, you've taken the example of Teesside, it's, it's very impressive what's happening there, and it's hundreds of jobs that are created there, locally, in the Northeast, to support um, uh, the, the amazing projects that are going to be built. But from the, the perspective of businesses as well, um, embarking into that journey, uh, sourcing renewable electricity, it's also a way to um, uh, source electricity that is cost competitive, you know, and, and we've seen recently uh, the price of gas going uh, through the roof. Um, that shows the value as well of having um, localized electricity production that's decarbonized and also increasingly cost competitive. Well, I'm going to move on, if you don't mind. We'll come back to you soon, uh, 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 Tristan, to Kevin Brown. Kevin, you uh, own a business that you started in your bedroom, and you're now turning over tens of billions of pounds. And you are in this zone which 15% of emissions were uh, responsible, uh, responsible for 15% of emissions in the, the slide I've shown. And that is residential, heating, plumbing, that kind of thing. I understand you're now the largest installer of heat, uh, air source heat pumps in the country. That's correct. So what, yeah. are your, what, are your, what, are, what are the products you're bringing to the party that will help towards the net zero agenda? Yeah, so I mean, our, our business fundamentally is about getting appliances you know, back up and running. You know, so we repair on a weekly basis about 8,000 appliances. Uh, we've got 400 engineers employed um, across the business to do that. And you know, from a that, that means, of course, appliances don't have to be built, and so the carbon footprint of them. Helps. Yeah. So, uh, in, you know, looking to the future, we won't be buying appliances as often as we have been doing. You know, the the thought of um, replacing your appliance because you replace your kitchen. You know, I imagine in 15, 20 years time, when my 10-month-old little son grows up, if I go to him and say I'm going to chuck this washing machine out and get a new one, he's going to be quite disgusted at me. Mm. So. Our focus is all about how do we keep those appliances going for as long as possible so that the waste from replacing those appliances is reduced. And then obviously, you know, once that appliance um, comes to the end of its life, hopefully there's someone in the room who's going to pick that appliance up and reuse all the components. I mean, we, we work with um, Gap Recycling at Gateshead. So if we have any waste refrigeration products, 99% of those waste products now can be 
um, reused in manufacturing. That's fantastic. So, so our job is to keep these appliances going for as long as possible, you know, and the manufacturers will, you know, in the future, it'll be more like a subscription model. So we're working with underwriters and insurers now about building subscription type warranties so that when the manufacturer's guarantee runs out, you will just pay for your, to keep your appliances going like you pay for your Netflix. Sounds, doesn't sound too sexy today, yeah. But Netflix wasn't known really five years ago, yeah. So as the right to repair starts to play really heavily on our conscience, you know, we will want, as human beings, we will want to make sure that we reduce our waste and that will be, that'll be ingrained in us all in five or 10 years time, if it's not already. You know. And I know you've felt very, been very committed to this for years, but you've also moved into uh, an area of uh, heating. So you're doing lots of boilers and lots of alternatives to boilers. Let's talk about the investment you've made there. Yeah, so you know, we've, we've gone from installing circa 10 heat pumps you know, per, per month you know, a couple of years back. Now we're installing in excess of 200 a month uh, heat pumps. And you know, we're helping educate the customer as well because this retrofit of heat pumps you know it isn't just a case of what we used to do is you know take the old gas boiler out put a new gas boiler in show the customer how it works and everything's the same you have to think differently about your heat it is a constant heat at a lower temperature you know so there's a big education piece to be done not just by us by the gov by government to hit this decarbonisation target 29 million homes in the UK you know, there's probably 28 million of them running on gas. You know, mm. that's the size of the problem. And, you know, that's going to be solved by heat pumps and by hydrogen. You know, hydrogen is running up the rails. Yep. Heat pumps is here and now. But they'll both play a really big part in the decarbonisation of the UK. I'm going to come back to hydrogen in a minute on everyone's view on hydrogen. But let's turn to Natasha. Natasha, we've got some people from very big businesses. You're a startup business, but you're no less committed to helping uh, our climate change agenda in this country. Can I ask Kevin, can you help Natasha, Natasha to lift this up? Uh, and Natasha, while he's doing that, can you explain what this product is that you've devised? Right. Yeah, so I'm How heavy is this, do we know? Uh, heavy. I'll try and use the proper technique. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm from a, a startup <laughs> based in, um, in County Thanks, Durham um, called Sparrow. And what we've done over the last couple of years is develop a carbon negative lightweight aggregate for concrete. So this is one example of where the aggreg aggregate could go. So concrete block work. Um, the blocks that make up your houses or your offices, um, but we're looking to use it in other concrete applications as well. Um, the real driver for it was um, a lot of our waste is actually burnt for energy, and I was quite surprised at that, and it's one of the most polluting ways that we can actually generate energy. Um, so what are the other options? You can reuse or you can recycle. And what we do at Sfera is concentrate on the reuse part. So we've identified a plastic waste stream that isn't recycled uh, for various different reasons. And we can actually repurpose it and reuse it in a different industry. So we use this um, waste stream to add value to the, to the concrete and construction industry by um, making an aggregate. Uh, for concrete. Okay, so you've used your know-how because your background is in chemistry, is it, uh, isn't it? Yeah, tell yeah. us about how you s establish a business. The business is called Sphera, S-P-H-E-R-A, Sphera. Tell us about how you establish the business with your colleagues. Yeah, so um, I don't think it was ever any of our plans to get into waste and construction. Um, we're all scientists. Um, we all met um, doing, doing PhDs in chemistry um, in the Northeast. And um, we, we were naturally inquisitive and actually wanted to um, be in an environment where you could see your impact and be agile, decide what you want to do every day and ensure that sustainability is woven into everything we do. So um, in 2019, we incorporated the business. Um, we've gone through a couple of um, rounds of investment and now we're looking to uh, really establish our roots in the Northeast, triple the team, um, and just scale up. Fantastic. And you're going to be in County Durham. Let's hear about the, the actual uh, efficacy of that product. That is a concrete block. When I picked it up, I thought it was an ordinary breeze block. What's the difference between that and an ordinary breeze block? Yeah, so 
I'm, I'm glad you thought that, um, because we initially designed the, the blocks to be identical to current Bruce blocks, because the construction industry has quite a reputation. It's quite traditional. It doesn't like change. So to force change sometimes wouldn't work. So if they can use a product that looks, feels, acts exactly the same as current products, um, then that's good and that creates impact. So, yeah, visually, you can see the, the blocks are completely identical. Um, they're the same strength as current breeze blocks, um, but actually they're up to 30% uh, percent more thermally insulating. So we're, we're continually doing tests on, on the thermal insulator, insulation properties um, to see if perhaps we could reduce the insulation um, that's needed to go alongside it. Um, but yeah, we, we do all of the tests uh, to, the, to the British standards. So it, it's got more efficacy in terms of insulation and in terms of its construction, it has within it component chemistry that's not just cement, but other binding products that are carbon negative. Yeah, so um, the, we, we concentrate on embodied carbon. Uh, so you've heard a lot about energy, um, but I think you're going to be hearing a lot more about embodied carbon in the future. And that's the carbon footprint of the materials that we use to build things. Um, and one of the, I guess, the most polluting materials in terms of embodied carbon is cement. Um, and that 50% of the, the emissions created from the production of cement is from the energy required, and 50% is through a chemical reaction that actually occurs during the, the production of cement. Um, so it, it's one of the most uh, polluting uh, materials, and actually tackling the embodied carbon of cement is really important. And um, we use cement alternatives. There's lots of different um, alternatives to cement being developed, um, but it's, it's a big growing industry. So how much more carbon friendly is that breeze block than a conventional one? So the, the aggregate itself is carbon negative. Um, and in terms of the carbon footprint of the block, uh, we're aiming for a, a zero carbon um, block. And we're wow. just going through, I think a, a, a good point to mention is the measuring. A lot of people don't actually understand the impact of what they're doing. They think, okay, I'll do that. That feels like the right thing to do. But if that comes from a point where you've measured that and you're 100% certain that's what you need to do, um, then that's a better route. So we make sure we measure absolutely everything. Um, we're, it, we've had a life cycle assessment completed and then the product EPD, so environmental performance declarations, will be declared. And I think a lot more products need that. And as consumers, we need to be um, more pushy to actually see EPDs um, and actually have a look at the, the environmental impact of what we're buying. OK, well, that, that is a fantastic... But give her a round of applause. She's in business. <laughs> it's your first business. And it's a great, great, great... Uh, a, a great example of a northeast entrepreneur, a young northeast entrepreneur, getting it together. Look, all of you have used technology to produce some solutions. Can I just ask you generally, I don't, who wants to answer this question first? Is the politicians that all talk about this issue and the activists that talk about this issue talk about punishment, they talk about taxes, they talk about restrictions. Have they got that wrong or is incentive and technology the way forward. Views? Who wants to go in first? <laughs> I think it's probably a bit of both. If I'm honest, you know, we, you know, we've just set out our plan this week to be um, carbon zero by 2030. Now, you know, my my overwhelming biggest problem is transport. So I've got 400 plus engineers all driving around in diesel vans. Mm -hmm. So even though I've got 100 kilowatts of solar. On the, on the warehouse roof, all my electricity is now renewable electricity. We invest in fair share to make sure that the food waste doesn't go into landfill, it gets reused. We do all of these things, but nothing really touches the transport problem. So that's definitely our biggest challenge over the next, I've said 2030 now, so over the next nine, nine years. Um, and we've got the first full EVs coming into the, in the business um, this year. And you know, after that trial, it, the infrastructure is so far behind. Yeah. So deployment of full EV across our fleet is impossible. How, how do we get the guy who lives in a tower block in London yeah, to park his EV and charge it? Yeah. yeah that's, that's our problem. So I think there's got to be, there's got to be a, a carrot and a stick. Yeah. 
it's got to be a carrot, you know, business to help business along. But there's also got to be a little bit of a stick to say, you know, you've really got to take some ownership and some responsibility and, you know, do this yourself almost. Mm. Um, you know, government does help, but I think they are far behind the businesses in this room who are thinking about, you know, how they get to net zero. Matt, on electric vehicles, my, all of my staff that have cars wanted to change to electric because of the tax incentive. That's an incentive, <laughs> not a penal rate of taxation. What do you think about this question on incentives? Where do you think they should be deployed now in vehicles? So, um, incentives have a place. Um, uh, the, the, the struggle that the government has with incentives is that be careful what you incentivize because sometimes it leads to behavior you really don't want. And certainly in London, that was part of the issue uh, around the incentives for EVs in the, uh, the low emission zone. Um, governments in general um, are generalists. They pass laws and they, they, they give frameworks and targets, which in the cold light of day um, are extremely difficult to actually deliver on. Now, when I started looking at and I used to work for the government, so I can talk from the inside on this. Um, when you look at some of the targets they gave, they didn't have any idea how they were going to achieve that. Mm. And the incentive, the incentive, as I see it, is that enterprise, business, taking that as a target can then innovate to get us to the target. Without a target, we meander. We always do, and I can tell you, as somebody who's been at the forefront of technology for, for the last 35 years, that's what happens. Engineers meander. Give them a target, tell them that's the deadline, they will deliver. Right. And Like they did with the vaccine program. Like the vaccine program, really great example. Very simple. A great example. Um, and and, the, and the, kind of the last thing I'll, I'll say on this one, Graham, is um, there is no greater incentive for business than driving the top line and driving the bottom line. If demand is there, people like me will find a way to satisfy it. Mm. And the demand is all of us. Okay. Well, I, I, one point on this, as Tristan, if you wish, but then I'm going to ask you all to futurescape and, and tell us and wrap up by looking at the future. Do you have a comment on the way that government is incentivizing? Yeah, look, I mean, um, I, I totally agree with the points made here. And I think um, uh, what we have seen you know, we, we, it's not a question about whether or not we will go to net zero because we will need to get there. It, it, the, the, the question is more how fast will we get there, right? And I think um, that's where public incentive is key in the sense that it can really accelerate uh, the learning curve on deploying these new technologies at scale. Just look at offshore wind as an example. You know, um, when I uh, started my career um, uh, around 2008, offshore wind was crazy expensive, you know, mm -hmm. uh, staggeringly so. Um, and it required public support um, to kickstart the industry. And by deploying offshore wind at scale, the learning curve has been incredibly fast. And now um, it's one of the most competitive source of electricity yeah. production um, across the whole, not just whole, uh, renewables, but across the whole spectrum. It's, it's staggering, and that has just happened in less than a decade. Um, and I think we'll see similar things happen um, in, in other uh, technologies. Um, and uh, it's great to hear about uh, Natasha and, and construction, about heating. All of that will need a bit of support. Mm. Heat pumps are the same, probably. You know, uh, Hydrogen will be the same. Um, but we can trust the business and the industry to deliver. Yeah. And I, I, you're right, offshore wind, there will be in the next few years more people working in offshore wind than there were 10 years ago in steel and just in Tisa. That's right. Island. Okay, last question. Uh, quick, 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 quick one for each of you, but I'll start with, with you, Tristan, because you're very expert in it in terms of energy supply. What will be the role of hydrogen in our energy system? Because we've got to produce it and it's expensive and not necessarily carbon friendly to produce. How will that work and where will it fit? Yeah, right. I think um, hydrogen has a key role to play. The way I describe it, um, it's the use of hydrogen is great to decarbonize what electricity can't, you know, in very simple terms. Um, there's a lot of things you can decarbonize through the use of electricity or electricity and batteries. 
In fact, you know, EVs are a great example of, uh, of that. Um, but for some applications, um, hydrogen is better suited than electricity. Let me take just two examples. Um, fertilizers production uh, actually uses hydrogen as a direct input into their um, industrial process. Well, if you can replace that carbon uh, uh, hydrogen with carbon-free green hydrogen, you, de you, you decarbonize that, that sector. Same with um, steel production, an, a, another example. And mobility, large vehicles, you could imagine also uh, hydrogen being a, a great application there. But can hydrogen be made in a carbon-neutral way? That's right, um, and there's different ways to do that. Uh, we talk about the different colors of hydrogen. You might have heard about blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, the different ways to, do, to achieve that. Um, currently, the, the, uh, uh, and, and probably we'll need all of those different colors of hydrogen, either by capturing the carbon that is um, emitted in the production of hydrogen, or by producing hydrogen f directly from renewable electricity using electrolysis. Yeah. Uh, which is, at EDF, what we uh, yeah, believe is, is uh, the, the, the key solution there. Both of those things are now being actively done on Teesside, aren't they? There's the That's carbon right. capture and storage, which you might read about in the papers, where they're going to produce hydrogen and then put the carbon under the sea in old mines. And then there's the way you're doing it, where you might take the electricity from a wind farm and power the plant. Or a nuclear power plant. And they get green yeah. hydrogen. Uh, Kevin, where do you see hydrogen in, your, in the actual heating system of people's houses? Yeah, so I mean, hydrogen is already um, playing a big part in um, in the decarbonisation. There's a, you know, there's already a mix of 20% hydrogen starting to go into the main, you know, the main gas lines, and a lot of the new boilers coming out um, can work on hydrogen or natural gas without any modification. So you know, they, the manufacturers are getting prepared or are now prepared, you know, for that. There's a big infrastructure problem. You know, we've got, a, we've just spent the last seems like. 40 years digging roads or putting new gas pipes in, yeah. are they going to be good enough to hold the hydrogen? And there's a debate there, isn't yeah. there? Because quite a few engineers say they are good enough and some civil servants say they aren't. The, yeah, so there's, there's that. So I think it will definitely play a part in decarbonisation of heat. Okay. Um, you know, and you know, I think the obvious choice at the moment are heat pumps. Um, heat pumps, like Matt said, revenue drives innovation. So as the revenue for heat pumps goes up, the manufacturers will start to drive the cost down. Okay. You know, so a bit like solar. Um, so I think that, and um, in transport, so my problem is transport from a carbon um, angle. And I think, who's going to win the race? Battery, hydrogen, or synthetic oils? And on that, because we're out of time, last word to Matt Boyle. Um, everybody's right. Um, <laughs> hydrogen, hydrogen has a part to play uh, in all of this. Um, uh, Depending on who you are, depending on which company and which, which strategy you're, you're, you're driving today, and quite literally you're driving today, hydrogen plays a part. Um, and as, as Kevin's just said, it, it, it is a mixture of hydrogen, batteries, and biofuels. Um, no one will solve all the problems, um, and therefore you need a combination of two or three. Well, on that note, I'll say thank you to my panel. Thank you for looking at our Business Unmuted Live, and thank you for joining us.